so as we move into the third decade of the 21st century, I thought we could take some time today to talk about the preservation of the past. Now, some of you may be aware via various channels, including the Dry Dock and uh, my Twitter account, that one of the side projects of the channel has recently been the acquisition of various images in order to preserve them and keep them in the public domain, as many of these images uh, that are around for naval history research purposes consist of things like glass slides and photographs, which obviously tend to be relatively unique, or and in the case of some of the glass slides, sometimes the originals from which various photos that are have been used in other publications have been based. And so if these are sold to private collections, they may well never see the light of day again in our lifetimes, and so be lost to the general public. But then how do you go about preserving these? Because it's not just enough to own them, you've got to get them out there, but you've also got to get them out there with information as to what they actually are. Since if you just say here is a photo of a battleship or a cruiser or a destroyer or a submarine or whatever, that might be a fun Easter egg hunt for a naval historian, but for the general public or someone who's trying to research a specific ship, that's not going to be of much help. So in this particular video, I'm going to go over a couple of techniques as regards the preservation of historical photographs and other similar images, as well as a few tips and tricks on identifying the ships that you might find in your photograph or other image. Now, when it comes to photographs first, they tend to come in a number of formats, but for the most part, the earliest photos, which obviously tend to be some of the rarest, as well as photos going to maybe the World War I and even the World War II period, are actually remarkably small. So take, for example, these photographs, which relate to an album that unfortunately was cut up before I could get my hands on it, so I could only acquire some of them. Um, but anyway... Um, this album concerns itself with the HMS Majestic, one of the earliest pre-dreadnought battleships. And as you can see, although one or two of the photographs are relatively large, most of them are absolutely tiny relative to the kind of photographs you might expect to find today. They're not even 6x4. Now move on to the World War I period, and still, as you can see, the photographs are still smaller than the average 6x4, um, which wouldn't become a standard until somewhat later. Now, assuming that the photographs haven't already become very badly worn, faded, battered, etc., which is, are all things that can happen, um, but even if they have, it's still worth preserving some of what you can still get out of them. But let's assume they're in relatively decent shape, as some of these are. How do you go about keeping this data? Because at the end of the day, even if they're locked away in a climate-controlled room in the dark, they're still going to age. And to be perfectly honest, the average person doesn't have a perfectly climate-controlled dark room to store photographs. So given that these things have lasted 80, 90, 100, maybe even 120 years, probably best to get their data onto some other medium, such as digital media. Now, there are a number of ways you can go about this. A lot of modern printers, even relatively cheap ones you can get down at any hardware store, and in the case of the UK, at least in some supermarkets, generally come with a built-in scanner. Now, a scanner, theoretically, uh, can scan up to relatively high DPI resolutions. That's dots per square inch. And to preserve as much data as possible, ideally you want to scan them in at the highest DPI setting, as a lot of these old photographs are obviously taken from negatives, which tend to retain a lot more data than the average modern digital picture. There are, however, still limitations to this, as a very tiny picture or one that's slightly blurred is not going to get magically more detailed just because you scanned it at 1200 or even 2400 DPI. So it may take a little bit of experimentation 
with a few photographs to determine what's the most efficient ratio of DPI versus image size, since obviously a higher DPI image will require a much larger photograph file size. A 1200 DPI image can easily run into 20 to 50 megabytes, for example. However, it must also be borne in mind that not all scanners are created equal. So yes, whilst this relatively cheap printer that I acquired might have a scanner that in theory can go up to 1200 DPI, if you compare and contrast this scan, which was taken at 1200 DPI using the printer that you just saw, versus this scan, which was taken at the same resolution on a much more expensive printer that just so happens to be one of the ones at work that I was able to grab during a lunch break, you can see that the quality of the instrument does make a reasonable amount of difference. Given that you can then obviously take files away with you on a USB stick or similar, if you really want to get into it, it might be worth looking to see if your local library or Photoshop perhaps, as in a physical building that sells photos and camera equipment, not the software package, um, to see if they have maybe some kind of free or relatively inexpensive scanning service, one either one you can do yourself or one somebody else can do for you, to generate better quality images. Or, as I said, if you happen to be lucky enough to work somewhere that has a whole bunch of expensive printers lying around and they don't particularly mind what you do in your lunch break, you might be able to take advantage of that as well. Either way, um, this method is relatively quick, relatively simple, and generates a relatively consistent output. However, let's assume that you either don't have one of these all-in-one printers at home, or you're not happy with the quality of the resolution you can get off of that, and you can't get access to a relatively inexpensive method of scanning nearby elsewhere. Well, what other ways can you use to store the images of these photographs? The other main way, believe it or not, is a photograph of a photograph, and that might sound a little bit stupid, and well, yeah, ultimately, in any case, either a scan or a photocopy or a photograph of a photograph is always going to cause a little bit of loss of data. But the camera on your cell phone or the camera on a relatively modern DSLR is actually a relatively powerful high resolution device. Now, certainly some cell phones can do this, but for the purposes of this particular uh, discussion I'm going to refer to a DSLR camera but feel free to just mentally substitute uh, a cell phone on a mounting bracket as opposed to DSLR camera if you so choose. Now the way that I've used to preserve some photos is as follows. You can see here you take a tripod and you mount the camera on it and you don't have to, again, you don't have to have a tripod, but if you can figure out some other way of securely mounting a camera in a face down position, then go for it. It could even literally be duct taping it to a bit of board. Um, you can always get inventive and where there's a will, there's a way. Anyway, the main point is to point the camera down. This is where lighting comes in. This is where scanners have the advantage because, of course, they have a light bar. But if you can control the light levels in your room, whether that be by additional lights, table lights, desk lights, or just your general lighting level is good, then great. Um, if you want to push the boat out a little bit again, uh, you can get relatively cheap um, photo studio setups, like 30, 50 quid, something like that. Um, again, you don't have to. Um, and let's face it, if you're paying 30, 50 quid for a supposed quote unquote photo studio setup, it's not going to be the world's greatest quality. But the main thing that you get out of those is some brackets, some nice white material umbrellas, and couple of really powerful bulbs and you can set those up to generate a backlight because the one thing you don't want with photographs is you don't want a point light source shining off of the photograph and reflecting up into the camera and you can manage that in a number of other ways um, it, it can have things to do with the angle that you are 
placing the photograph relative and the camera relative to the light source. You can try covering the light source to make it a bit more diffuse with something like um, some paper or whatever, but obviously do be careful. Um, I use LED light bulbs in the house, so I don't have to worry about heat, but if you are using an older halogen bulb or a standard filament bulb, obviously don't wrap it in paper because then it'll set everything on fire, which is bad, especially because your photographs will burn. Um, along with your house which is probably not the best thing that since sliced bread but assuming you've managed to not set fire to the place of your habitual abode then you can start with the photographing now this is where a dslr camera has certain advantages because they can zoom and in this case you can see i've got a medium scale zoom lens um but other zoom lenses are available and to be honest even your standard 35mm lens will probably do the job. The idea is to zoom the camera in so that the picture occupies the whole of the camera's view. Um, if you're using a phone probably best not to do that because the zoom capability of a camera on a phone normally unless you've got one of the ridiculously high-end photo phones um, is not that great. It tends to be more of what they call a digital zoom, which basically is just enlarging a section of the image so it becomes slightly lower resolution. Um, so if you are using a phone, just lower the phone until it's in the right position. This obviously does have complications with making it harder to avoid casting a shadow on the photo, but this is kind of why I recommend using some kind of dedicated digital camera with a, with a proper optical zoom. But anyway, once you've got everything aligned, I would probably recommend setting in the camera settings a timer, maybe a two second delay, um, just to avoid vibration and shake, and then press the button and wait for the camera to go click. Once the camera's gone click, I would generally take one or two additional ones. Now, whether you want to autofocus or manual focus is entirely up to you. Um, the only other tip that I would say is that if you're having issues with the light balance, tend towards taking a photo that's slightly too dark. Obviously, you don't want something that is completely uh, shadowed out, but if don't overexpose the image. If you overexpose the image, if there's too much light, then you can't recover that. Whereas if you've got the camera, a relatively decent camera that's shooting, um, that's either taking maybe the raw file, if you're going to get really really technical uh, and into it, or if you're just shooting standard JPEGs, even so, um, a little bit of basic photo editing can recover detail that's lost in a little bit of an underexposed image, but you can't capture detail that's been whited out by an overexposed image. That's just a little tip I picked up from a photographer friend of mine. So whether you've scanned, whether you've um, taken a photograph, whatever, you now have a digital image file that is the photograph that you possessed. And what you'll find when you load it up on your computer is that it will come up at a much, much larger scale and still be clear than it was as a small 6x4, which again is the wonder of the average uh, modern digital scanner or camera. And especially if you're looking at something that's even smaller than a 6x4, you might be looking at that thinking, oh, wow, this, this ship is two, three inches long. And then, boom, suddenly it's in glorious 3,000 by 2,000 pixels on your screen. And you can see all sorts of details that you'd otherwise have needed a magnifying glass to see in the original photo. And more importantly, this format is now preserved and is not vulnerable to moths and things like that. Now, notice in all of this, I'm not talking about things like uh, cinefilm uh, film strips uh, or the original uh, celluloid negatives. And that's because if you somehow manage to luck into some original film footage on a film reel or uh, the celluloid negatives of certain uh, of naval photographs from sort of the World War II and earlier era, I would strongly, strongly recommend you get them to a specialist with, who works with old film who can then transfer them to a digital media or develop them into proper photos because, well, to be frank, I have a limited understanding about how to develop 
um, 35 millimeter film. I do know how to do it as I used to uh, own a 35 millimeter film camera. Yeah, believe it or not, I'm that old. My first camera was a proper film one, not a digital one. But there is no way I'm going to be handing out advice to anybody on how to develop a hundred year old celluloid film. Um, leave that job to the professionals. Uh, because, yeah, if you dissolve that thing, it's gone forever. Now, the next thing that you can look at is these glass lantern slides. These are kind of actually like a f actual film negative, only being on glass, they're somewhat more resilient, um, albeit that obviously as glass, they're much more vulnerable to being scratched. Now, the disadvantage of these compared to a quote-unquote normal photo is that a photo can still offer a certain amount of detail, especially with a magnifying glass, when inserted into a photo album or similar. A glass lantern slide looked at in the light is absolutely tiny. Um, it, they're, they're only fractionally larger than 35mm film uh, stills. And in the average uh, sort of light source, they look really faded out. You might think, actually, there's not much, if any, information on this thing. This is where you'd be wrong, because they're being glass, relatively completely inflexible, and they take detail really, really well. M superior, in many ways, to 35mm film. They're obviously a lot more bulky to store, but eh, they last longer. And so if you can get some of these, this is where you really, really want to try and preserve them. How do you do this? <laughs> because, as I say, tiny, don't look like much. Well, they would have been used in, well, glass lanterns, um, and they're basically the precursor to 35mm film slides, which, for those of you who weren't around for the 35mm film slide era in the 70s and 80s, and, well, to be honest, I wasn't around for the 70s, I was barely around for the 80s, but whatever. Uh, my dad was a very enthusiastic 35mm uh, film slide photographer. But anyway, th th they are the precursors for those of you who live in the modern era to the PowerPoint or Instagram slideshow presentation. But enough, enough about that. Um, the best way to preserve them is to get a high power constant light source and here again having something that is not potentially going to heat them up and destroy them is a good idea um, light boxes are again a relatively cheap thing that you can purchase um, but just try and make sure that it is a constant light um, you want something that's nice and smooth you don't want differential lighting because that will highlight up some bits and not others in my particular case, I can improvise a little bit because I happen to have this um, daylight simulating light, which is very useful, as you might imagine, in uh, dark and dreary England during the winter for generating some quite powerful um, light coverage. And this is a constant light source. And you can see here, it literally shines, shines like a small burning star. And it is configured to the more natural light wavelengths. So I can just turn this thing on, pop it on its back, and pop the slide on top of it. The instant you do this, and obviously try not to get something that's ridiculously powerful, otherwise you might well do yourself some eye damage. Um, but when you do this, you can then see how much detail is actually preserved on these glass lantern slides, assuming that the original uh, photograph that was taken on it was any good. So when it comes to preserving these, basically the best way is the camera on a tripod or similar method or phone on a stick or whatever that I described earlier. And this is what I do for my glass lantern slides, as you can see. This is relatively simple, pretty much follows the same procedure as with photographs, but this is where the uh, DSLR camera with an adjustable zoom really comes into its own. Because these things are so small, if you've got a decent optical zoom lens, you can actually then zoom right in and get as much detail as you can from a sort of a, a full frame picture. And 
if the when you're doing this you actually see on the view screen or on the um through the eyepiece that actually this detail is really good you could even be sort of ultra experimental and zoom in even further and take a whole series of photographs um and then stitch them together to get an even larger even more detailed photo the only thing i would say with this is that once you've set up your camera at the right angle um and you've got everything done for that don't move the camera around because if you move the camera around you're no longer getting a straight down shot um which is going to introduce minor to major warping in the image what you want to do and this is why having a flat light box is a good idea is configure your camera in a set position and then move the glass lantern slide around on your light source rather than move the camera around to match the glass lantern slide and in this way you will create an image uh, again i would recommend taking two or three just to um, make sure you one if one of them falls victim to wobble or um, poor saturation then you've got others rather than having to go through this having to set the whole thing up again either way you've now got your image and you can now begin processing it now the first thing i would say is whatever you do keep your original images whether you've got them in jpeg png raw file whatever keep your originals because every time something is altered every time a filter is put on or changes applied there's always going to be a little bit of loss of data so given that these pictures have gone from being whatever it was that was actually photographed to a negative potentially into a photograph in the case of photographs obviously in a case of a glass land and slide that it's just the negative which is why potentially some more detail can be preserved on those things but anyway um they've already gone through at least one or two data transformational steps so there's already been some loss so at this point you put them through another data transformational step there's still going to be some image loss um, it's unavoidable but hopefully you keep it to an absolute minimum um so always keep those originals then take a copy and then start playing around with the copy because then if somebody with more powerful tools comes along and you're willing uh to let them have a go you can give them a copy of the original and they can start out from there but anyway some of the things i find quite handy if your light level is unnaturally yellow or any hue other than the original um something even really basic like uh, the windows photos or similar equivalent product um, something free generally has some relatively reasonable tools to help deal with the uh, with some minor detail issues and so here you can start off with the basic stuff so you can straighten the photo so either if this was mounted at an odd angle or you took it at an odd angle or whatever it was important just to use straightening to just make sure it's all nice and level um, if necessary if it's coming at 90 degrees or whatever you can rotate the photo around and you can also crop the photo so you can see in this particular case um, this scan was all over a little bit all over the place it was at an angle um it was on its side and there was a bunch of other photos so you can you you format your photos so you've actually got what you want in the view great fantastic then you can move on to filters now if you're happy with the color of the photo obviously skip this step um if you're not then you can use a basic filter again you're trying to preserve historical data so avoid this if you can and if you have to don't do something uh, silly like make it pink or blue or bright yellow just for the sake of it looking making it look old um just choose one of the more basic filters um to give everything a uniform color appearance and go with that so with uh in this case i'm just using photos because it's again it's cheap and free if you happen to be a wizard with photoshop or similar then fantastic use use something better than this but i tend to like to use either slate for black and white or sunscreen for sepia um but you don't really have to do i mean sauna is kind of all right but whatever um filter intensity generally 50 percent just hit enhance your photo that's fine um, this just will give all your photos a uniform coloration but as i say 
this is basically to correct overall hue errors from your lighting source. If you can at all avoid this, then please do so. Um, but again, this is why you're keeping a copy of the original scan. Then you can go into adjustments and light levels. You can play around with that. See, usually you don't have to do too much with this. Um, but again, if if the thing's been over or under overexposed, there's not a tremendous amount. You can do try dialing the light down a little. If it's been underexposed, um, then you can dial the light up a bit um, or whatever. But just play around with the light levels just a bit so it looks to your eyes a little bit more clear. Um, likewise with color, color just leave it. Um, uh, again, if you've if you've run a color filter already, definitely leave it. If you're if it's just a fraction off, then maybe play around with it just a bit, but not much. Um, Vignette just ignore red eye spot fix ignore that. The only other thing that's left is really clarity, um, which can help enhance contrasts. So in very certain cases, it might be worth ramping the clarity up a bit, but that can also result in the loss of detail. Um, so just be very careful. I'd never under clarify something personally in my, in my experience, but sometimes just edging the clarity up a bit might help um, to emphasize detail. So once you're happy with all of that, then save your changes, save a copy, and you have your final product, which you can then use with however you like, assuming that um, these are your photos and this is why i say this is uh, a thing i will go for glass lantern slides and i'll go for photographs i won't go for postcards because we've all got limited resources and at the end of the day something that is a postcard was probably mass manufactured and that means there's probably more than one copy of it out there probably a lot more than one copy of it out there and someone's probably archived it already so unless you particularly just happen to like a particular postcard. Um, in terms of preserving historical data, I tend to go for actual original photographs um, and uh, glass lantern slides. Now, of course, all of this is fine if you're creating a copy of an image for your own backup, research, etc. purposes. But when it comes to making it publicly available, this is where you start to skirt into the realms of copyright. And this is another reason I try and avoid things like postcards, because postcards, it's far more likely that there might be some form of copyright or trademark still active on them. Um, likewise, if you buy um, digital CDs of um, or CDs of digital photos, it can be somewhat of a question as to what copyright applies to those particular images um, and I'm not a copyright expert I don't claim to be and I'm not obviously trying to give you legal advice however um, when it comes to purchasing things like glass lantern slides um, and original photographs of historical naval images at least in the UK and again so check with your please check with your local copyright laws depending on which country you happen to be in but in the UK at least the way that I operate is under the fact that in UK law a photograph that was made before the 1st of June 1957 which is when the period obviously of photographs that I'd be interested in um, covers um, they were protected for a period of 50 years from the end of the calendar year in which they were taken. So that will have long ago passed. And this is regardless of whether or not they were published. So that's that's how long in the UK those photographs have been protected uh, by copyright. It does note that if a photograph was still in copyright in 1995, then that was could then be extended to the more modern copyright period, which is life of the photographer plus 70 years, which could bring photographs back into copyright. But at the end of the day, when you're talking about glass lantern slides and private photographs it's a fairly safe bet that someone wasn't holding them in copyright up until uh 95 but there you go so always always be a little bit careful um but generally speaking um you can be relatively safe and i mean if if you're talking about stuff like this with pre-dreadnought era stuff that was taken in 1900s 1910s the copyright almost certainly would have expired even before 
the 1950s, 1960s, so pretty safe, pretty safe at that point. But again, not a legal expert, please do your own research on that point, I'm just explaining my position on things. Anyway, so you've generated your picture, and great, fantastic. Now, you've got to figure out what this is actually a picture of, and the first person who comments, oh, it's a picture of a ship, uh, why have they not invented the ability to reach through the internet and grab people? Um, anyway, some pictures will come with data on them. It might be written on the back, it might be written on the front, on the case of last lantern slides, it might be inscribed into the glass, um, either in the picture itself or next to it, which can usually be a pretty handy pointer. Um, for example, this image that says, this is obviously a battleship being launched, and at the bottom of the glass slide is is scrawled uh, Queen Elizabeth at launch. So this would suggest that it is the HMS Queen Elizabeth at its launch back in the 1910s. However, you can't always necessarily rely on this because although usually the people who are taking the original photographs are pretty good, they do make mistakes. Um, and uh, some of them can be subtle, some of them can be pretty obvious, um, such as pictures of armoured cruisers that are labelled as battleships, for example. So let's say you have a picture and you either don't trust or the information that's related to what it is, or you don't know anything about what it is, nothing of particular use. Um, so let's take this example um, for, uh, as a one which is uh, taken from a glass lantern slide that I recently uh, digitized. So this is a pre-dreadnought battleship and it didn't come with any information. The seller just said it's a warship. Well, yeah, well done. Um, but other than that, there was no information as to what it could possibly be. So I'm now going to walk you through some basic techniques to help identify a warship. And we're going to use two examples. We're going to use this example, and we're also going to use a much closer in shot that a subscriber asked me to help them um, look at and identify. So using this one to start with, first step, try and identify what navy it serves in. So usually these ships will be flying flags, and in this case, very usefully, you can see at the front there is a flag flying on the bowsprit, and that almost certainly makes it British since it's a Union Jack, although do be careful because the Imperial Russian Navy also has this kind of pattern of flag um, as one of their ensigns, and so this can lead to some really weird confusion when people see pictures of the Gangut class and other similar uh, Russian ships from 1910s and 1920s and back into the 1900s. And they're like, why is this ship flying a British flag? Well, that's because in black and white, they look very similar, um, even though they're actually completely different flags. But anyway, what helps in this particular case, apart from the fact it's not got a massive tumble home, so it makes it very unlikely that this is a Russian pre-dreadnought, um, and incidentally you can tell it obviously it's pre-dreadnought, uh, one main turret up front, one main turret at the back, but you can also see here there's a white ensign flying from the stern. So this is a British warship. Great. And as we said, it's a pre-dreadnought battleship, almost certainly. Um, from the layout of the main guns alone. Now we need to go further in. The trick here is to try and pick out very easily identifiable signature items and work from there to eliminate some possibilities. And then that once you've eliminated some possibilities, you can pick another item and work your way through what's left. So in this case, very obviously, you have the two funnels. You can see they're the same size, and they are one behind the other. So when you're going through British pre-dreadnoughts, you can start knocking off certain battleships. So in this case, you can immediately knock off the Royal Sovereign class, the Centurion class, and the Majestic class, even with no other data than the funnels, because on those three classes, the funnels were side by side. And these aren't, so it's not any of those. You can also knock off HMS Renown, uh, the 
slightly small 1895 Bridge Dreadnought as it only had, again, side-by-side -side funnels. Then, so that leaves you with the Canopus class, the Formidable class, the London class, the Duncan class, the King Edward VII class, the Swiftshire class, and the Lord Nelson class. So what else can we make out? Well, we can see that this ship has casement-mounted secondary battery guns. So that immediately rules out the Lord Nelson class because their secondary battery had rather obvious 9.2-inch turrets, uh, which these don't. Um, you can also take a look at HMS Swiftshire and eliminate that very quickly from the competition as that particular ship, as you can see, the funnels are far more spaced out. So we're moving down through the possibilities and we're only using funnel data. So still on the funnels, we can also now rule out the Canopus Formidable and London classes because when you look at those, you can see that the rear funnel on all of these three classes is somewhat bigger than the forward funnel. And on this particular ship, the funnel is most definitely the same size. So we are down to the London, uh, the, the Duncan class, sorry, and the King Edward VII class. Great. So we, from all possible British pre-dreadnoughts, we've narrowed it down to two classes and we haven't gone beyond the funnels. So now we can look at something else. So something else that's fairly visible on this photograph is the secondary battery. We're not going to look at the primary battery because it's a pre-dreadnought. Um, the, the primary batteries of British pre-dreadnought battleships can look fairly similar. Um, so we're looking at the secondaries. So between the two, the King Edward VII class, although it's not quite as obvious as the Lord Nelson class, also have 9.2 inch turret mounted secondaries, whereas this ship quite clearly doesn't. It has double stacked casements of the same gun size. So that actually has already narrowed us down just with two bits of identification to a Duncan class battleship. Now we can look into the Duncan class a little bit more to try and verify our identification. So let's have a further look at some Duncan class ships. Um, so for example, we'll take this picture of HMS Russell and we can see that, yes, it has the double stack casements, the same as our ship in the photograph. And yes, between the double stack casements on the lower of the two gun decks, there is a single, um, there, sorry, there are two single casements. So for, that's a total of six casement mounted guns per si side of this caliber, which data tells us is a six inch gun. So that's all great. Then between the upper casements, we can see that there is a plate and then an open uh, gun deck underneath the boats. And we can see on our photo that that is the same. So even better. Um, we can also see these slightly odd uh, assemblages just between the funnels and behind the funnels. And we can see on our photo that these are here and these are actually relatively unique to the Duncan class. Um, so we're doing quite well. We're pretty certain that this is a, in fact, a Duncan class warship. Um, but we can also look at a couple of other little identifiers to make sure. I mean, you can see the bridge structure is pretty similar. The, uh, well, it's the same actually. The um, masts are again matching. But the other thing to look for is this forward um, section. Now, this photo is a starboard side, whereas we're looking for a port side. So let's go looking for a image of one of these class, one of this class of ship on the port side. And we can see that here is a port side image. Now you can see this is actually quite important because the starboard side, you see there are two anchor chain holes here, whereas on the port side there's just the one, and we can see on our image on the port side there's just the one, and you can also see there's the recess here for a smaller tertiary battery gun, just a single one. Um, many British pre-dreadnought battleships had two in this rough position on the bow, and we can see here again just the one. So we're pretty confident that this is in fact a Duncan class.
so so far so good we're we're pretty certain this ship with no data other than funnels and secondary battery is in fact a duncan class warship what else can we do to try and identify it now this is where just looking off of photos can be pretty much the end of the line unless you're really good at picking out very distinct aspects of ships um recourse to naval references is very handy in the case of this as it's a british battleship um the wonderful book british battleships by oscar parks is very handy because another key distinguisher of this particular photograph again going back to the funnels are these striped bands and we can consult with british battleships by dr oscar parks and we can see that in this he describes that these were identification bands for various ships and we can see that from the photo that the hull is light the bands are dark so these aren't white bands and that rules out this ship uh this photograph having taken been taken in 1909 or forward um and then we look at these and we see right there's actually two possibilities for ships with uh what appear to be a single dark band because it's not necessarily clear if this slightly thinner upper band is um actually part of the id so we know this is probably uh hms russell or hms duncan so we're down to one of two ships and then we can have a quick look through some other photographs of the two ships um and find ones where they have these dark bands the early identification bands on their funnels and we eventually find that on hms russell the bands were lower and here's a photo of hms duncan and it looks basically the same so we're very confident now that this is the pre-dreadnought battleship hms duncan herself first of her class and she is in her early to mid 1900s configuration so going from absolutely nothing using just openly available images on the web and one bit of uh, recourse to uh, a reference book we've identified not only exactly what this ship is but even roughly when this photograph was taken and of course if you were looking at those although uh, that reference book is very handy you could obviously just keep looking through photos of the ships of that class until you happen to stumble across the match so you didn't even strictly need the reference book although it was very handy at eliminating the rest of the class very quickly and so to wrap up this particular video we're also going to look at this little photograph now this one was one i say was sent by a subscriber asked me to help identify what it was and we did manage to figure it out believe it or not and this procedure goes as follows given the origin of the photo coming from the usa it's reasonable to suspect that this vessel is american um but can't assume now what are the first clues um even if we ignore the men in the, in the uniforms because let's face it not everyone knows exactly what every navy's uniform looked like first thing first look at the bridge structure you've got this kind of bird cage arrangement above the actual bridge itself so this gives they'll give us something of a clue but what era are we looking for well from the evidence right in front of us we're looking for a ship with pretty large guns given the size given the men standing next to them and we're looking for a ship that dates so this is probably a pre-dreadnought because it's large guns and there's only the one turret and the bridge because we can see the main deck we can see the gun turret we can see the bridge almost certainly a pre-dreadnought possibly an armored cruiser you never know um but it's of that era so now that we know the era we're looking for have a look at some pictures of u.s battleships at the time because this is what we suspect it is and there you go there's the birdcage kind of arrangement and the bridge shape so this is very definitely a signature of the u.s navy of the period now i happen to recognize that straight off when i saw it but this is a relatively easy way to check so great so we now know it's either an armored cruiser or a pre-dreadnought battleship of the US Navy.
Now, thankfully, <laughs> thanks to some rather odd design decisions by the US Navy, we can start rapidly eliminating certain choices. The fact that the main gun is forward of the bridge el immediately eliminates the original USS Texas and the USS Maine, um, as they did not have this uh, forward arrangement. So that leaves us with um, the true pre-dreadnought battleships. We can also immediately eliminate the Kearsarge class from the running, as the Kearsarge had the double stacked secondary battery turret on top of the primary battery, so we know it's not that. Um, and likewise, we can eliminate some of the later ones like the Virginia class. So we're doing pretty well at this point. But once again, believe it or not, it does come back to the funnels. Um, because, as you might notice, you can see a funnel emerging on either side of the main mast behind the bridge there. And taking a quick look through the various reference photos of US pre-dreadnought battleships, unlike the British, for which this would leave open quite a number of possibilities, as we discussed in the previous um, image, there's only one class of US pre-dreadnought battleship that has side-by-side -side funnels, and that is the Illinois class. Now we did mention that it could have been an armoured cruiser, but we can do a very quick check since there were only two major classes of armoured cruiser plus New York, Brooklyn, and well, Maine is sometimes called an armoured cruiser, sometimes a battleship, but whatever. But very quickly we can see that none of them, none of the American armoured cruisers had these side-by-side -side funnels. So great, so we're down to the Illinois class. Um, by very simple process of elimination. So again, we can look at some open source photos and we see, yep, birdcage, side-by-side -side funnels, um, main battery, uh, single turret up front. And so we're down to a choice of three. Um, so we have Illinois itself, plus her sister ships, the Alabama and the Wisconsin. Now, in this particular case, somebody has been very handy, and you can see in the middle of all the crew, they're holding a ship's crest, which says forward on it, and also happens to have this little carved creature on top, um, which is some kind of muster lid. Um, I'm not, I mean, I'm not American, so... I'm going to put my hand up and say this is this is not uh, my str uh, my strong suit. Um, I I did have to go to some of the American um, American subscribers on Discord and ask about this. Uh, but this is the thing: if you're not sure, ask someone who's likely to know. Um, it can never hurt. And they pointed out very happily to me that of Illinois, Alabama, and Wisconsin, the only one of those three states that has it think anything that could potentially be described as a muster lid on their state seal is Wisconsin, which apparently has a beaver on it. I'm not necessarily sure this is the world's best rendition of a beaver, but whatever. The other thing, though, is that the Wisconsin state, steel, state seal um, does in fact have the word forward on it, <laughs> relatively obviously. So we have the word forward, we have a beaver, and on this photo we have the word forward and some kind of muster lid on a battleship that is going to be one of three, so it's a pretty safe bet to say this is a photo of USS Wisconsin, the Illinois-class pre-dreadnought. And so that's two very basic run-throughs on identifying ships. Um, I can do more of those, I guess, at some point if people are interested. But hopefully this has been a nice little uh, segue, a nice way to warm up going into the new year, describing both how to preserve the more common types of historical photographs that you might have or might come into your possession, and then if you don't know from the photos what you've got, how to run some basic checks to try and figure it all out. Um, and although please don't deluge me, but if you do happen to have a historical photo out there that you are genuinely curious about what it might be, um, then feel free to drop me a line uh, via email or Discord uh, message, and I'll I'll have a go. I'll have a look. Um, as I say with the Wisconsin one, I eventually had I had to ask for some help. So I'm not a panopticon. I'm not all seeing and all knowing. Um, so I may be able to 
give you a direct identification. I may only be able to say, well, it's from this navy and maybe from this class, but I don't know the exact ship. Um, but I'll do my best to help, and I will. If I can't help you as much as you'd like, I'll try and point you in the direction of someone who can. So, with that all said and done, thank you very much for listening to this uh, slightly off-topic, well, not off-topic, a little bit off-kilter video, and uh, we will return you to your regularly scheduled naval history in the forthcoming week. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.